Hello everyone, my name is Hani Mansurian and I'm the co-coordinator of the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action. I'll be quickly presenting the technical note for protection of children during the COVID-19 pandemic that the Alliance produced. It was launched on the 16th of March, and since then it has been shared widely and several technical annexes related to some of the specific technical areas of child protection are also being developed around it. The Alliance is a network of about 100 organizations that work on protection of children in humanitarian settings, and our main work is related to standard setting, development of technical guidelines and guidance and tools to support practitioners in the field who are protecting children. The technical note can be found on our website, which is also available in Spanish. The technical note itself is available in Spanish. If you look at the address that is underneath the slide here, you will be able to find it. Now about the structure of technical note, the technical note uh, starts by describing how the social ecology of the child, which is basically a child at the center, the family, community, society, and the larger sociocultural norms get affected by a pandemic such as COVID-19. Of course, we have at different levels, we have different risks and vulnerabilities that affect the child. From the child level, looking at issues of separation, increased levels of stress for children. When you go to the family level, issues such as loss of income for the family, not having access to childcare, because children, most children, as we know now, up to 1.5 billion children are now out of school and families don't have an alternative. And of course, quarantine measures and other containment measures do not allow families to have any external help, even sometimes from their extended family. At the community level, trust sometimes gets affected. Relationships that exist that can support a family or a child across neighbors, extended family get affected. So families can't count on each other. The issue of stigma is coming up at community level. If someone is affected, then everyone around them will be stigmatized. And at the society level, of course, issues such as lack of access to services, services that are for some families and children are essential, such as nutrition, for example, or some social work and social welfare services for children who live on the street, for example, shelters. All of these are now either at very reduced capacity or completely closed down and shut down. And of course, at the broader sociocultural norms level, you have the issue of, again, stigma, for example, that is a, that is a huge issue that sometimes lasts way beyond the pandemic itself. Child protection risks themselves are plenty the examples from or evidence from other similar epidemics. Of course, none of them have been at the scale of COVID-19 so far, but evidence from Ebola, from SARS, cholera, they're suggesting to us that there are multiple child protection risks that emerge in a situation like this. Neglect and maltreatment go up. We already are seeing reports, unfortunately, of severe maltreatment and abuse of children. Domestic violence has started increasing in most societies, and we're not just talking about places where we typically work, places that already have high levels of violence. We're also talking about places that don't have necessarily high levels of violence or child abuse. Even there, we are seeing an increase, unfortunately. Increased incidence of violence, not just domestic violence, but also outside of the home, in the community, we're seeing increases. Mental health and psychosocial distress is one of those areas that is seeing a huge increase in issues. Families, don't have a buffer, all the pressure that comes on them, either because of economic hardship or because of illness within the family, gets transferred to children. Children require their own attention. They have needs that often cannot be met. They can't meet with their peers anymore. They, in turn, kind of pass on their stress and distress to their caregivers, so it becomes a cycle of worsening psychosocial distress situation. Exploitative and hazardous labor is something that increases in these situations because, again, because of the impact on the economy and loss of jobs and loss of income, those that are looking for, to exploit cheap labor from children are more likely to try to exploit it at this time because adults may not be allowed or be willing to work. And of course, families that are 
facing severe poverty and lack of resources may risk sending children to work, even though they know that it's dangerous, but they may not have a choice. Separation from families, both due to the hardship, but also sometimes due to quarantine measures, due to uh, illness itself. During Ebola, for example, we saw a lot of children being separated when either the child got sick or the parents or the caregivers got sick. And it took, in some cases, a long time for us to be able to reunify them with their families. And stigmatization and exclusion, as I mentioned before, especially against communities and subpopulations that are already stigmatized and marginalized, increased stigmatization and exclusion takes place. And of course, disruption in social services that for some children and some families is life-saving. Part two of the technical note talks about what we can do. So the response part, so the first part was more about what the problem is. And the second part is more about what we can do. And we divided it into two sections or two subsections rather. 2.1 talks about how to work with other sectors and with governments because there are Governments especially are at the center of the response and some of the other sectors such as health also are a big player in the response, but also sectors like nutrition, health, water and sanitation are ex extremely important in terms of partnership with child protection to make sure that we have a very holistic approach to addressing child protection issues and preventing them, hopefully. And then the 2.2 subsection looks at child protection specific programs and it, it's basically based on the standards within the minimum standards for child protection and humanitarian action. Some examples of what we can do is for example with health and education training health and education and social service workforce in identifying and addressing protection risks and measures that can support children in this situation. Mapping and disseminating information about available services because it's a family or a child may be used to receiving specific services, for example, nutritional services from a center that might be closed now. There might be alternatives that can they can tap into, but they may not have the means to identify those. So as child protection actors, helping them identify those is one element of our work. Establishing pr procedures to reduce the risk of separation. This also can be done with other sectors, particularly with health because they will have quite a bit of a role uh, to play in terms of separations that specifically take place at health facilities, but also with other parts of the government, like police force and those that are enforcing, for example, quarantine measures. And sometimes it's just about ensuring that the government has a central database where any separation that is due to containment measures is registered so that beyond that moment when the child or the family are ready to be reunified, they can be reunified without scrambling for which child belongs to which family and, and all of that. And of course, in that, for example, make, making sure that there is contact if the child has to be separated, making sure that there is uh, contact with the family. Facilitating access to available protection and other care services for vulnerable children and adults. Sometimes it's a financial barrier that we should try to to address in some countries, even accessing health services for coronavirus related disease or, or side effects has prohibitive costs. So people can't even go to the hospital, even, even if they think they have coronavirus because of pro prohibitive costs. And of course, all the other costs will go up in a situation like this. So ensuring that supporting the removal of some of those barriers is important. Supporting families, of course, with school closures, the burden on the families has, has gone up. Homeschooling is not an easy task. A lot of us, including myself, who are doing it with our own children know that it's a very significant task and, and it has to be taken seriously, but supporting families to be able to create an environment in which the children do not only learn, but also thrive and their emotional distress is, is addressed and, and hopefully all their needs are addressed. With governments advocating for flexible work arrangements for parents, some of the professions are considered essential. So a lot of in a lot of countries, for example, of course, health workers, but also other essential elements like some factories have to continue producing. Otherwise, either food will be short, short or some other equipments that are needed, either medical equipments or otherwise that will not be available. So those professions have to continue working, but at the same time, they don't have childcare. So ensuring that there's flexible work arrangements for those professions. Financial and material support to families that are suffering from loss of income and ensuring continuity of provision of social services. Sometimes this is about just making sure that 
you maintain contact with cases that you have been working with through the phone or online, or in some specific cases, ensuring that there are there is actually face-to-face -face follow up. Of course, respecting all sorts of guidelines in terms of distancing and not exposing yourself or the child protection actor, nor the the children and their families. And of course, there are legal issues around moving around and being in touch with people that should also be taken into account. Some of the questions that were highlighted during the the webinar include. For example, are there standard operating procedures for case management? So there are a few countries that have developed these, not necessarily standard operating procedures, but specific guidelines on how to adapt your case management service. Lebanon comes to mind and Iraq. And if you go to the Dropbox that the Child Protection Area of Responsibility has put together, you'll find those examples. Are there resources to accommodate the need of separated and accompanied children during lockdown period? There is a guidance note that will be an annex to the technical note that will be available probably around the 6th of April that addresses the issue of, of alternative care specifically and children in alternative care during the COVID-19 pandemic. So hopefully that will help. Are there some materials already developed specifically on stigma prevention? There's quite a bit of material that has been um, developed for this um, by the Global Partnership to End Violence. Some of the organizations and NGOs have developed very good material and several of them are available online and also through the CPAR Dropbox. What strategies can be used to reach out to children at risk of neglect, abuse, and exploitation when in lockdown? This can potentially be a very long conversation, but one of potentially the simplest answer we can, we can give is empowering and strengthening child helplines and making sure, making sure that there is functioning and empowered child helpline systems. Of course, in, both in terms of their ability to, uh, to receive and respond to calls, uh, but also in, in, in their ability to do referrals and follow up afterwards, because we also don't wanna be in a situation where we have children, for example, we set up referrals, a complaint mechanism, or a hot, hotline for neglect and abuse and exploitation. Children call and they are in, in uh, urgent need of support and we're not able to to support it so a specific annex on on this issue and how to to support children through helplines will also be upcoming for the technical notes in the next two to three weeks how can we support parents and caregivers that is probably one of the largest parts of what child protection actors should be doing at, at this moment because of the access issue. And that's, again, some of it could be through helplines where parents can call and receive advice on how to deal with um, the stress of them for themselves and for their children, how to create an environment in which the child can both learn and, and thrive and have a responsive care, but also making sure that all the other services, including, for example, financial assistance is available to families and caregivers that have lost their income and are uh, scrambling to put food on the table. There are several resources in part three of the technical note. You will see on this page and can find it on the technical note. Just to end with the promise that in the next few weeks, we're going to update the technical notes. We have received quite a bit of feedback from the field on things that we can improve. And given the evolving situation, the technical note is going to be revised and hopefully improved over the time. So towards the end of April, there will be a version two of the technical note that will come out. Thank you very much and keep up the good work in Latin America region. And we wish you all the success and safety um, while dealing with this pandemic.